Hey there, welcome back to Point of Sale, the retail supply chain show where we break down great retailers, the supply chains that move them, and the data they use to make decisions. I'm your host, Andrew Cox, and senior retail analyst here at Freightwaves, and today we are talking about one of those great retailers, possibly the great retailer of the 21st century. It's, of course, Amazon, and we are speaking about Amazon with the man who knows Amazon Logistics better than anyone outside of the Amazon Logistics uh, infrastructure who doesn't work at Amazon. His name is Mark Wolfratt. He is the president and founder of, of, uh, of MWPVL International, excuse me, a global supply chain consultancy. Um, <clears throat> and before I bring on Mark, I would like to take a moment to thank my sponsor, ArcBest. ArcBest is more than logistics. Whatever you do, whatever you ship, ArcBest makes it easier for you to do business. ArcBest combines reliable capacity, innovative technology, and trusted relationships to take the complexity out of your supply chain and keep your shipments moving. That's what makes ArcBest more than logistics. Mark, thank you so much for taking the time, and welcome to Point of Sale. Well, thank you for having me. Mark, before we hop into Amazon, I didn't know if you had seen the news on Peloton this morning. They're going to have to be recalling, or they are recalling all of their treadmills, something like 130,000 units in North America. What do you make of that? I think they're not even going to uh, pick them up. They're just refunding because of the logistical nightmare that it would be to pick those up. But, but what do you make of them having a recall? And, and would you go through the effort of trying to pick up those big heavy machinery? Well, all I can say is I wish I would have bought a Peloton <laughs> at this point. Listen, I didn't hear that story, so that's news to me. Ah. But it uh, sounds like a catastrophe to have to deal with. Yes, exactly. I think they're trying to avoid the logistical catastrophe by just offering people um, you know, their refunds. But it's a $5,000 bike or a $5,000 treadmill, and now they've got this you know, 500-pound piece of metal that is deemed too dangerous to use sitting in the corner. I think it, it, is, it is a nightmare. But let's hop on to Amazon, and let's talk about your data, because you have, the most, I think, the most robust data set of Amazon logistics locations uh, of anybody outside of Amazon. So let's talk about your data, and also give us a little intro to yourself and, uh, and to your consultancy. Well, I've been in supply chain consulting for 34 years. It was my first job out of university. I'm a mathematician by training and uh, a little bit of a pack rat by nature. So that kind of lines up with why we gather this data. A long time ago, I, I kind of was looking at Amazon from the sidelines and saying, gee, this company is really becoming uh, important, you know, 14 years ago when I first started looking at them. And uh, I said, uh, Nobody seems to know how they do things from a supply chain perspective, and that intrigued me. And uh, they also seem to be very secretive about what they do. You know, they didn't want people really knowing. A lot of their buildings don't even have a logo on the outside. So uh, a little light bulb went off in my head, and I said, you know, I'm going to check this out, try to catalog this. And of course, they were much smaller back then than they are today. You know, we have well over 1,500 buildings in the network that we track right now. And every day, it seems we're adding another couple more to the network. So this company is growing like wildfire. Really like a black box around not only their logistics uh, operations, but their entire, uh, their entire operations. How do you compile this data, and why have you compiled it? Why is it so important? Well, it started out as a personal project. We wanted to understand how they go to market so that, uh, you know, a lot of our clients were asking um, you know, about uh, e-commerce strategy and how they should set themselves up and what was Amazon all about and how were they doing it. And uh, when I didn't have the answers, that was all part and parcel of, of, uh, of going after this data. So it was kind of uh, uh, to be a better consultant, I guess you would say, was why we started doing this work. Uh, in terms of, um, you know, how we go about gathering the data, well, that's, there's a little bit of secrecy there on our part. You know, we don't want to give away too much information, but we've got uh, probably about 30 to 40 sources that we rely on quite heavily. Um, and, 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 it, and it's a lot of hard work, to be honest with you. There's no screen scraping or automated anything. Every single one of the facilities that Amazon operates, we're trying to catalog not only where's the building and what's the role of the building, but how many people work there, uh, what, the, what type of operating expenses would they be incurring, how many units would be handled through the facility, what type of fixed and variable operating expense would be there, and so on. 
<laughs> Sorry, we had uh, Kevin walk behind the uh, right, right behind yeah. me here, so he threw threw me for a loop. But let's talk about 2020 because Amazon went through a growth spurt yeah. that is unprecedented, probably in any company history. They've uh, added, you know, something like 300 facilities, added a million square foot of yeah. of warehouse facility just in the U.S. alone last year. So talk to me about that growth spurt. What kind of buildings are they building? So the last year, the uh, numbers that we have show they they added about 110 million square feet to uh, to million 110 million square feet to the overall global network. Okay, um, and that number is a, a you know it's just a number for some people, but just to put that into perspective, um, Walmart over the course of 50 years built their distribution network uh, you know since the 60s and. It totals about 143 million square feet in the U.S. So to think that Amazon in one year would add close to 110 million is is simply unprecedented in the history of mankind. You know, this is by far and away the most aggressive uh, rate of development we've seen industrially, and you know that breaks down roughly 75-25. So 75 percent of that space was in the U.S. and it was uh, split kind of 50-50 between fulfillment centers and delivery stations. Okay, so roughly about uh, 39 uh, million square feet of fulfillment center space was added to the US network and about 43 million square feet of space was added to the delivery station network. These are two very, very different types of buildings that play very different roles in, in the company. I consider the fulfillment centers to be the cash register of the business. This is where we make the sale and we pick, pack, and ship the order. And the delivery stations are a fundamental part of Amazon's um, build out to become their own transportation service provider so that they no longer have to rely on, on external third party carriers to get packages to the customer. And uh, Mark, when you are looking at these delivery stations, because these are kind of interesting to me, it, I've seen that they've made a lot of like makeshift uh, type centers that often are in like parking lots of old buildings or, or they're in like, you know, I, I read one at I think an old um, a baseball stadium in New York or something. Can you talk to me like what are they just throwing these up as wherever they can? And are these delivery centers, are they just truly to be a, a consolidator for Amazon Flex drivers to come pick up goods or they're acting as a USPS um, postal um, location? Well, first off, a delivery station is the second element within the transportation network. Even before it gets there, the package has to pass through a regional sortation center. Well, the role of the delivery station is to uh, organize packages into efficient routes, outbound routes, for all customers living within roughly about a 45-minute drive radius of the building. That could be 5 to 10 miles of radius. It could be 25, 30 miles of radius, depending on what part of the country or what city we're talking about. So a market like Los Angeles, you might have 40 delivery stations just to get packages to people living in the greater LA area, for example. Um, and there are differences between the different types of delivery stations. You've got heavy, bulky ones that do appliances and furniture and TV sets and things where there may be an element of white glove service or they may be heavy products that two people have to lift and they have to go on a specialized uh uh, box truck, for example. But most of the volume that we're talking about goes through normal small package delivery stations where packages arrive uh, overnight, starting around midnight at 7 a.m. They've all been sorted into these uh, dollies. Uh, and then the dollies are basically organizing everything by route. And so between roughly 7 and 9 a.m., you might have anywhere from 100 to 1,000 delivery vans that pull into the delivery station to be loaded. And that all goes back to the size of the operation. So in some cases, the delivery stations may only do five to 10,000 packages a day. Others are doing upwards of 40 to 100,000. Um, and it all goes back to how many vans are, are being loaded out at a delivery station. Some of these newer ones, the prototypes they've got, you know, this acreage on the site is 30, 40 acres. You've got uh, over 1,200 vans that are parked on the premises. Uh, maybe the building's about 150,000 square feet. There's a canopy outside the building where all the vans platoon in. You might have 72 vans platooning in at a time. They get loaded over a 20-minute period. They move out. The next platoon of 72 move in. So it's a military-style operation. It's run like clockwork with, uh, with absolute precision. 
So they've really gotten good at this, and they've got the cost of the package um, down to a, a science center. And, and uh, you know, the fact that they're not using their own labor force, they're using, uh, you know, third-party companies, small third-party companies that are clustered in each one of these delivery stations to do the work. It means that they can get um, absolute lowest cost out of the whole uh, system. And Mark, are these delivery stations, is it a market-by-market uh, market decision, or are, are these d delivery stations mostly being uh, serviced by those delivery vans, Amazon delivery vans? I mean, how, you know, how does UPS fit into this delivery center network? Is it just dependent on uh, what market it is? UPS, generally speaking, don't, nothing that goes to the delivery station ever makes its way to UPS. So if, it, if the package is deemed to go to UP, via UPS, they actually have their trailers pull up right at the fulfillment center and they get loaded right out of the fulfillment center. They take those packages and they inject them into the UPS network. Think of UPS as doing all of the work that is done far away from where Amazon has infrastructure. So they would, you know, if, if we're talking about Billings, Montana, where Amazon has absolutely no infrastructure, then a fulfillment center place or that's filling an order for a customer in Billings would ship via UPS and inject it into their network to get it out there. Because Amazon has nothing in Montana to speak of. So think of UPS as being the carrier of choice for anything far away. For anything where Amazon does have infrastructure, they have their own regional sortation centers. They carve that volume up between uh, urban, suburban, and rural. So urban, suburban, they try to handle that with their own delivery stations. And rural, they handle that with the post office for now. The ultimate end destination of this company is to do the whole thing themselves. I have no UPS, have no post office. It's my belief they want to have the Amazon uh, logistics umbrella cover uh, the entire continental U.S. Uh, and eventually, you know, Alaska and Hawaii as, as well. So I, I don't, we can use Montana as an example, given they don't have any uh, facilities there. You know, how long till they have facilities in Montana? Are we looking at a three-year development until they have, you know, until they're covering pretty much every square inch of the U.S.? Well, take a look at the population of Billings. I forget what it is, but uh, <laughs> it's, it, that's really the answer to your question. Is uh, if you took the U.S. population and you sorted it in descending metro market sequence, um, and you can really quickly see how Amazon's going about their rollout strategy for, for fulfillment centers. Uh, so, of course, New York, L.A., Dallas, Chicago, Atlanta, all these uh, big, big cities were the first ones they conquered. And after that, they started going down to the cities with a million people. Then after that, it was down to 700,000, 500,000. Now they're getting into cities of 400,000, meaning a place like Shreveport, Louisiana, population 440,000, it's going to get its own fulfillment center right there in its backyard, very quickly followed by a, a network of delivery stations to service that market. So if Billings uh, has a population of a quarter million, they'll get there, but it'll be in priority sequence of really where the sales are coming from. Mark, talk to me about, uh, you know, Amazon's obviously trying to speed up the delivery of everything, eventually probably get to a same day on as many items as they possibly can. Talk to me about how these, uh, all of the different offerings that they have right now, you th how you think they're going to come together? Because honestly, to me as a consumer, it is a bit confusing right now when you've got Prime, you've got Prime Now, you've got same day, some same days coming from Amazon, some same days coming from Whole Foods, you've got grocery and, and dry bulk coming from different areas. How do you think this all eventually comes together? So we always have to think of food and non-food as two separate stories, because with food, when I go and pick your order and there's ice cream and there's strawberries, and there's mushrooms, and there's a lot of temperature-sensitive merchandise, I can't take your tote and start navigating it through different nodes in the supply chain. And so six, seven, eight hours later, it winds up at your doorstep. It'd be lovely if I could, because I could, I could harness some synergy, and maybe you know, get your book order and your DVD order combined, and then go to your house once. It's, it just doesn't work like that in food. So the way it works in food is, they pick the order, they try to get it to your house within two hours. And that's really for, for food safety reasons, because oftentimes it's a gig worker that's driving the merchandise to your house. They don't have a refrigerated vehicle. It's in the trunk of their car, you know, and everything's spoiling for every minute that it's, it's in that environment. So food is always going to be its own supply chain, its own distribution network because of the, uh, the, the refrigerated nature of the merchandise. Okay, Everything else that's ambient, we can think of uh, primarily a supply, you know, the, one of the issues that, that make it confusing is we've got 
you know, call it 300 million, however many items that are out there in the Amazon marketplace that are being distributed through these fulfillment centers. And no one fulfillment center can actually physically stock the full array of products, right? So there's always going to be an element of when I buy that obscure Halloween costume for my daughter online from Amazon, I have really no idea where it's coming from, right? I could be a New York customer. It's coming from Tampa. It's coming from Seattle, right? So I'm prime and they want to get it to me in two days. They're, they'll use their air network to accomplish that. The product might get loaded up at the Seattle airport. It'll fly to Hebron, Kentucky, get sorted out there. Now it'll make its way over to New Jersey. Then it'll go to a sortation center. Then it'll go to a delivery station and then it'll get delivered to my house. So all these nodes they've built up to move the product within two days, coast to coast, within their own network is, is, is simply incredible. But for the most part, it's fulfillment center, two sortation center, two delivery station, and it's that two node uh, delivery step that they have to go through. And what's taking place now that's really new is this whole notion of taking the fulfillment center and the delivery station and bringing them together as one, right? And, the, and, the, and these buildings, you know, call them speed buildings or same day buildings, but they can't do it for every item and they can't do it for every city. What it is is um, take the top 100,000 highest velocity SKUs that generate all the excitement, right? Your, your Coke, your Frito-Lay, your, your, uh, your you know, paper towels, your diapers, all those kinds of items that people um, consume day in, day out. Put those into a distribution facility, earmark half of the facility for that inventory, pick a pack and ship those orders from that half of the building, have a chalk line running down the middle, and move all of that across the chalk line to the other side where you have a delivery station that's you know the other half of the building. And load up those vans so that if you order by 8 a.m., you can have it at your doorstep by, by 2 p.m. And there's really no reason for you to ever get off your couch, right, if you want some of that stuff. So we're seeing that roll out in all the major markets now. You know, the latest one's Toledo, for example, that just opened up a month ago. So that's the idea. Take out all those intermediate steps and bring the, bring the fulfillment center and the delivery station into one building. And Mark, so... Uh, that, that does that all makes sense, but my, my I, I keep coming back to Amazon combining the food and the dry stuff. Like uh, you know, are these new facilities that they're building outside of I think one was outside of Nashville, another maybe Orlando. These kind of smaller the, the facilities you were speaking of, smaller facilities. Yeah. Are any of those uh, eventually going to have any cold storage that you could have uh, maybe you know basically small fast moving pro- produce next to also fast moving um, dry bulk SKUs that could go out together, kind of take advantage of that long tail when you get them in for grocery. Is that you think that is going to be a plan eventually? Uh, I think that's the case for a limited variety of product, right? They may have some freezer display cabinets there with vanilla ice cream, for example. Mm. And uh, so they would pick that. But again, we have to always keep in mind that anything coming out of the refrigerated environment, really, we're talking about um, a two hour lifespan right. for that merchandise to be shipped to your doorstep. So let's let's go back to the logistics network for a moment. And I, I did, you know, this seems to be what everybody is expecting. It, it seems to be an inevitability that Amazon eventually opens this network up to other retailers, similar to how they did with AWS. This would just kind of be brushing off the old playbook. Uh, is that something you're expecting? And when can we expect that? There's been a lot of conjecture about the transportation network opening up to uh, other entities. And right. uh, so... Um, you know, one of the things that uh, I've always debated in my mind's eye here is that Q4 is a make it or break it quarter for Amazon, right? We've we've got uh, 33% of their sales going out in one fiscal quarter. And um, the capacity crunch on peak days, Cyber Monday, Black Friday, you know, the build up to Christmas is so severe. We can see volumes doubling, tripling or more on, on a peak day relative to an average day. And... Um, you know, Amazon's building up this network to support its business, first and foremost. It doesn't want to build up a network necessarily uh, to support other people's business. Its main goal is to support its own business. So when peak day comes around, Cyber Monday, and everybody's peaking around this time, Christmas, um, Amazon's going to have a network of transportation built up primarily to support itself. So what is it going to say to everybody else that signed up for the program? Sorry, guys, we can't 
you can't deliver today because it's a busy day for us. So go find somebody else to go and work with. That might work with a mom and pop type outfit that's, you know, okay, well, fine, I'll, I'll go to UPS or FedEx or, or whoever um, today instead of Amazon. Um, because Amazon's normally cheaper and, I'll, and I'd always prefer to go with Amazon, but because I can't do it in the fourth quarter, I'll go to these other guys instead. Um, but when you're talking about, you know, large shippers that, that have uh, package shipping volumes uh, that might, say, be $5, $10 million a year of, of shipments, that's a lot of money. And when they, at the beginning of the year, sit down with UPS and FedEx to negotiate contracts, they get annual discounts that are predicated on their commitment to a certain volume, right? So I can't go to somebody like UPS and say, you know what, I'm going to use Amazon for Q1 through Q3. And then Q4, I'm going to switch horses and run with you guys. Right. Um, first of all, that would wipe out any discount I get from them. And second of all, they wouldn't want anything to do with that because they're suffering from the same peaks as everybody else in Q4. So they want your volume all year round. They don't want to over magnify that by having this type of thing happen. So, you know, for the larger shippers, I can't see Amazon as being really a viable shipping alternative. I've been wrong before, but that's my opinion on that subject. For smaller mom and pops, I, I don't see why they wouldn't, especially the 3P vendors, I don't see why they wouldn't leverage Amazon as a carrier come the day when Amazon actually has, uh, you know, true coast to coast coverage. Mark, I'm glad you brought up the point of how Amazon is, has kind of insulated itself with its logistics network. There's something I wrote about on Monday. It's, I was talking about an early prime day. They're going to plan to do it in June of this year. Uh, and it, it, I think it's going to create kind of another, they created a 75-day peak season last year with an October prime day, kind of brought the shopping, uh, the, the holiday shopping season further out and created an extended peak season. I think they're going to re try to recreate a similar uh, peak season here as, as a segue in the back to school market. But uh, my whole my whole thing that I came to this conclusion of is that Amazon can induce higher transportation demand and higher parcel demand because everybody else follows them with discounts and deals and it creates spillover effects to the whole industry. So they can induce higher demand and higher likely higher costs for their competitors while also being insulated from it because they can lean on their own logistics network. So do you do you agree right. with the fact that you agree that uh, they actually might be hurting uh, their competitors more with an early Prime Day than they even are boosting themselves? And they're definitely going to boost them. Themselves. Well, you see that trend happening right away. You see all these uh, copycat type, uh, you know, um, like this Amazon Prime Day and Cyber Monday and Black Friday. All of these things are being replicated around the industry. I think you're absolutely right, you know, and, and everybody else has to scramble to get the resources and there's no guarantee that their third party carriers can support them on these peak days and these events. And eventually the third party carriers are going to wise up to this and say, guys, you know, you have to. Yeah, we're going to have to charge you more when you start doing this surge demand volume because that drives our costs up, right? So, and, and at least Amazon is in a position where those constantly increasing surcharges that are getting layered on by the carriers, they're distanced from that now because they control their own destiny. So they've definitely created this competitive advantage that, um, that none, of their, none of the other retailers have by setting this network up. It's been one heck of an investment to do, and it'll take another several years to finish. But when it's done, I mean, they'll have a moat around the castle that is completely impenetrable. I can say that. No one can penetrate, shall we say. Yeah. 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 For, for sure. I, I wanted to ask you, I don't know if you keep up with uh, like Amazon sales growth versus their shipping cost growth. I love that Amazon comes out and they tell us how much their shipping costs and fulfillment costs grow quarter over quarter. I, I wish more retailers would do that. But uh, it seems that for the last few quarters, given this huge investment that they're making, their, their fulfillment and shipping costs have been growing in line or a little bit higher than their sales growth. Do you, uh, do you see a point at which we're in, in, encroaching on where that starts to change and they start to kind of show the operating leverage that they have here with these investments? Well, in order to really do justice to this process, you kind of need to look at the, the shipping cost per unit, per physical unit, because Amazon sells digital units, plus they sell physical units. So first of all, you need to um, start estimating what the physical units are, which we do. And we've seen a steady progression in the cost per unit for shipping, at least from the data that we've got. And, um, you know, one has to ask yourself, well, why would that why would that be? Well, there's so many levers going on in this uh, transportation network that they've got. It, it's actually a far more complicated story than I think most people really appreciate. So by way of example, when I shift volume away from UPS 
to Amazon Logistics, I'm saving money. Otherwise, why would they why would they do this? So, I'm, let's say I'm saving uh, one or two dollars a package. At the end of the day, that's good. Whenever I open up more delivery stations, more fulfillment centers, more sortation centers, I'm moving more volume under my cap. Great, I'm saving money. Um, but I've also opened up, you know, 58 heavy, bulky delivery stations, which handle appliances and furniture and things that cost maybe sixty to hundred dollars to deliver. So the more volume I do there to support my large, not sortable network, the higher my shipping cost comes on a per unit basis. Because those are the expensive things, right? Um, the further away I ship, the more expensive life is. So as I get closer to market with my fulfillment centers, I ship less distance and therefore my cost should go down. But uh, I want to offer two-day service level to all my Amazon Prime customers, which means I'm building up this big air network. And air, as you know, is the highest cost per, per pound uh, by a long shot of any of the modes of transportation. So the more volume I push into the air network, the more my costs go up. So you can see there's this teeter-totter happening where some things are going up and other things are coming down. And I don't have the, uh, I don't have the uh, ammo to figure <laughs> out the exact magnitudes here. I would say overall, though, we're probably looking at um, continued escalating costs as they really heavily invest into the delivery station network uh, over the next two, three years. Then I would expect it to cap out, and then I would expect to start seeing it go down you know, probably by a good 20% uh, percent in terms of cost per unit. Well, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, you, you say the word levers, and it, it just reminds me of Amazon. Like, they're always pulling some kind of lever to find more money somewhere. They're adding on a service here. They're adding on something that you didn't even know you needed to make more money. Uh, I did want to ask, you know, we've only got a couple minutes here. We, we spoke about how UPS and USPS <clears throat> serve different um, serve different reasons, have, have different purposes in the Amazon network. I wanted to know if, if you thought that there was one or the other which they would first try to disintermediate. Uh, do you think that they'll, they'll go after the routes that they have, uh, the rural routes, the USPS, or those kind of, I guess those would probably be easier to disintermediate than the, the stuff that in Billings, Montana, that, that UPS covers. What do you think? Well, in order to get to the out-of-region uh, areas of the country, that means they need to build out their fulfillment center network. And those are the big 300 plus million dollar buildings that take, uh, you know, a good long time to put up because they're, they're large operations, right? Thousand plus people. So they can only do so many of those in a year. Even Amazon has constraints on its budget, um, which means that in the short term, I think we'll see these wagon wheel, what they call wagon wheel delivery stations. Uh, I meant to ask you about these. Uh, yeah, so you may have heard that term, and that's really Amazon venturing into the countryside, hence the term wagon wheel. Uh, so you'll see places like Joplin, Missouri, and uh, uh, Orland, California, you know, really low-density populations where uh, Amazon's putting up delivery stations to go after um, areas that would normally be covered by the post office. So in the short term, I would say the post office is probably getting the greatest single impact of package reduction relative to what's going on with the delivery stations. Uh, in the long term, it's going to be both. UPS and uh, the post office are going to take a hit on the volume because Amazon ultimately, like I, my thesis here is, doesn't matter what corner of the U.S. we're talking about, they want to own that uh, underneath their own AMZL, AMXL uh, umbrella. Well, uh, some crazy times ahead of us right now. Amazon is on a tear. Absolutely. Mark, thank you so much. I wish we had more time. We'll, we'll come back together here in a few months and discuss the, all the other new openings that they're going to have in the, in the next couple months. Hey, been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. All right, that is Mark Wolfratz. He is the founder and president of MWPVL International, a global supply chain consultancy. All right, a lot of, lot of great stuff there. We've got all, another episode coming up next week. I'm going to be back with Dennis Anderson, the chief customer officer at Arc Best. We're going to be discussing customer obsession and how he is reshaping uh, the customer strategy at Arc Best. All right, that's been episode 12 for Point of Sale. Make sure to go and subscribe to the Point of Sale newsletter. That comes out on Mondays and Thursdays, covers more of these topics in depth. Uh, you can find that at freightwaves.com slash POS. You can also subscribe to Point of Sale, this show, uh, anywhere you listen to podcast, Apple Podcast, or Spotify to catch us anytime on demand. Or you can subscribe to Freightcast, where you can get all of FreightWaves audio podcast on one feed. Very neatly put there. All right, that's been episode 12. Thank you so much for paying attention to me. We'll see you next week. Thanks.